Our sermon tonight out of Josiah, uh, rather out of 2 Kings chapter 23 and 1 Kings chapter 13. Those are quite far apart, but we'll see why. This is Josiah's King Josiah, King of Judah, part six of his life. Josiah the prophet and the lion. Okay, so we're going to be covering Josiah's way down here at the end of the timeline of, of the t- tribes of Judah, uh, the nation of Judah. The southern kingdom, just a few years before Babylon comes, takes us captive. But not only are we going to be talking about Josiah, this passage also talks about Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the first king of northern Israel after the split. We had David, Solomon, then Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And then the nation split during the time of Rehoboam. And Jeroboam took the northern tribes, the northern ten tribes, uh, became known as Israel and began his own dynasty, which only lasted him and his son, and then, but his own king, the own kingdom, and it continued on uh, dynasty after dynasty, where the southern had one dynasty, David, David's dynasty, David's line, all the way throughout. Northern had different. So we're looking at almost the last king of Judah, as well as the first king in northern Israel. Now, by the time of Josiah, you see, northern Israel's already been taken captive by the Assyrians, and for the most part, been dispersed. They left a a remnant there in northern Israel, which we've read a little bit about. Um, And uh, and so that's where we're at, Josiah. Okay, so picking up the text, 2 Kings 23, verse 14, Josiah broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and filled their places with the bones of men. So Josiah goes through the nation, Judah, and, and, and gets rid of the idols and then, and it, oh, even up into the northern part, into Israel, he goes up there and, and gets rid of many of the idols up there. And then he goes through a second time and cleanses the land again after he finds the Bible and begins reading the scriptures and goes through and does even a further cleansing. Then verse 15, the altar that was at Bethel. Bethel was north of Jerusalem. It was part of Israel, part of the northern Israel, not part of Judah. So again, he's going up into the territory that technically wasn't his, uh, but he goes and he's claiming all of Israel for God. And so he's going up into that area as well and continuing the reforms and reformation up there. And so it's the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jeroboam, that king of Israel, the very first king of Israel, the northern Israel, the high place which Jeroboam who made Israel sin. So we're talking over 300 years later, and he's still referred to as the one who made Israel sin. He gets the responsibility and the blame for everything that took place after that. So he made the high place, who made Israel sin, um, had made both the altar and the high place. uh, Josiah broke them down, And he burned the high places and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. So everything there that's at Bethel, which was a religious high place for northern Israel, he goes there and he crushes it and breaks it all down. As Josiah turned, I love when the Bible gives us these little action words, these little extra words that can help us to really live there, be there, and, and see and experience it. So Josiah is there, they're breaking down the altar, they're breaking down the wooden image, they're breaking it down, and he turns, and he saw tombs that were there on the mountain, and he sent, and he took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar, the altar that Jeroboam had built, and he burns their bones on this altar. And he defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed. What man of God and what did he proclaim? We'll get to that. And the king said, what gravestone is this? So he turns, he sees this cemetery, he sees these tombstones, and he has them going and digging up their bones and burning them on this altar to defile the altar. And he notices a specific gravestone that must have somehow stood out to him. Maybe it was different. Maybe it was what was written on it. 
uh, maybe where it was placed, maybe the size of it, but something about it was significant and special. And he says, what gravestone is this? This specific gravestone. And of all the ones that are there, and all the bones they're taking and burning, he wants to know about this gravestone. And the men of the city said, it is the tomb of the man of God from Judea who foretold the things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. He said, let no one move his bones, let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. So who is this prophet from Samaria. So we got this man of God from Judea, and we have a prophet from Samaria, both of them mentioned here. And they say this man of God, this is again 300 years after this man of God lived, and yet here in Bethel, they still know the story. They still know about it. They still know about him. And what he said about that altar. He is the one who foretold the things you have done against this altar. So he says, oh, leave his bones alone <laughs> and leave this other prophet's bones alone as well. So in order to get the rest of the story, as uh, Paul Harvey would say, we need to go back 300 years or more to, or so, to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28. Jeroboam, king of Israel, made two golden calves and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now that's interesting. Because when we left Egypt and we came to Mount Sinai and Moses is on the mountain uh, for 40 days and they built a golden calf, Aaron built a golden calf for them and says, this is the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, from Aaron's time, even though Moses smashed that idol and took the gold and into dust and spread it in the water and made them drink it, that calf somehow resurrected and multiplied. <laughs> and now it's two. He divided and is now two golden calves that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, one in Bethel and the other one up in Dan. And a man of God, chapter 13, 1 Kings 13, verse 1, a man of God went from Judea to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. This is the man of God mentioned in that 2 Kings chapter. We never get his name. Mentioned in two different chapters, hundreds of years apart, his name might not even be on the gravestone, I don't know. But no one ever mentions his name. He's always known as the man of God from Judea. And he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord, saying, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. Wow. You can't get any more specific than that. 300 years in advance. A How old was Josiah when he becomes king? Eight years old. A child. By name, Josiah, 300 years in advance. Josiah will be his name, and he shall be born of the house of David. That the house of David is still going to be around 300 years later. Jeroboam, your house is not going to last very long at all. But David's house is going to last, and a boy, Josiah, is going to become king. And he'll burn men's bones on this altar. And he will sacrifice the priests in the high places who burn incense on you. Very, very specific, very detail, 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 detail. Right? Like four or five specific things. This man of God mentions. I just said, so, so exciting, right? Power of the word of God. 
And the word of God, if the Lord saw this man of God who doesn't even get a name, (laughs) he sees us as well. And he knows about us. He knows about our posterity. He knew about David's posterity. He knows about each one of us. And evil might be seeming to reign for a while, but God will have the last say. And there will be men and women of God who will take a stand and stand up for God. That's what God has called us to. So God has known our names. God has known about us before we were ever born. And he knows the plans that he has for us. For each one of us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, but to give us hope and an expected future. A place reserved for us in heaven and a place for us to serve him here on earth as well. This is the sign the prophet, the man of God from Judea continues, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So he gives two more in addition to the five or so that he's already mentioned. A child, Josiah by name, house of David, priests killed on it, bones sacrificed, burned on it. This altar is going to split apart. Ashes are going to be poured out. Now, this is what that altar looks like in Dan. So we can imagine that the one down in Bethel was very similar, if not exactly the same. Now you can see here in this picture, the metal altar, that's not original, that's put there to give you an idea of the dimensions and the size, so a very big altar, and they know that from the, from the foundation, right? that they know that's the size, and and the shape of it, because, again, they, the foundation is still there. The foundation stones are there, still there for the altar. So that's the size of the altar up at Bethel. Bethel is the very northern portion of Israel. And then the steps behind it and that platform bef- behind it is where the golden calf was. So it was one big cow <laughs> that was worshipped and then the sacrifices in front of it. So that is where they're standing. Again, picture the same thing in Bethel. And when King Jeroboam heard the man of God, he stretched out his hand saying, arrest him, and his hand withers. Boy, I wish that would happen to everyone who points their finger at me, huh? (laughs) Everyone who tries to say something nasty about me that their hand would wither or something like that power of God, right? When God chooses. And the altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And this took courage on this man's part to go from Judea and go up to Bethel where Jeroboam, the new king of the New nation. He just caused a revolution and, and, and split the nation in half. Obviously, he's got a lot of influence, a lot of power. Rehoboam in the south couldn't withstand him. And this man goes up there and he's going to withstand him? Especially during his altar dedication? His old, this is the whole thing? And this guy's going to come up and just, you know, throw water on his party and get away with it? It's a courage. Faith. Conviction, fear of the Lord, and no fear of man. The definition of that is meekness. Fear of God, but no fear of men. That's true meekness. And he goes there, denounces, the guy points his finger, arrest him. And under human circumstances, he'd be arrested and killed so fast, he wouldn't have time to blink. But he stands his ground. Prophesize what's going to happen to that altar. It's going to get split apart, ashes on it, all this stuff. It's going to be destroyed. Your priests are going to be burned on it. Their bones, bones are going to be burned on it. Stands his ground. And God defends him. God doesn't always defend all his prophets. God doesn't always defend us here on this earth. But he defended him here. Man's hand, the king's hand withers. And part of the prophecy takes place right before their eyes. 
The king said to the man of God, please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand be restored to me. Now, I wish that he had kept that attitude. But just like Pharaoh of Egypt, pleading for God to help him to get rid of the plagues in his time of need, but we know from history that Jeroboam never repents, never reunites the kingdom, never gets rid of the golden calves, never reforms, never repents. He just wants his hand back. He's not pleading to God. He's not repenting before God. He's asking him, please pray for God to restore my hand, not to forgive me for this golden calf, not to forgive me for this altar, not to save my soul, but to heal my hand. Better to lose your hand and enter the kingdom of heaven and to miss out on heaven and have both our hands. So the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. I don't know if I would have done that. <laughs> Maybe that's why people say it's with it before me. I don't know. Yeah, let him live with it for a little while anyway. <laughs> but that's the man of God. He intercedes for this man as he requested. And God heals and restores him. The mercy and love of God. The mercy and love of God for Jeroboam. And he sends the man of God there. That he sends a message of rebuke, a message of correction. The love of God that he withers his hand to get his attention. The love and mercy of God to heal the withered hand. Oh, that, that would have melted Jeroboam's heart. But it doesn't. The king said, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. The man of God said, the word of the Lord commanded me, you shall not eat bread nor drink water nor return by the same way you came. So he went out another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Very specific. God gives him specific directions, what to do, what to say. Exact prophecy. And don't eat there, don't drink there even. And then come back a different way. And so he says no to the king and goes according to the word of the Lord. Again, meekness. Fearing God rather than fearing men. An old prophet dwelt in Bethel and his sons told him all the works that the man of God had done that day, including the words which he had spoken to the king. Now how did his sons know that? They were there. What were they doing there? <laughs> But they were there. So they come running home. Dad, you got to hear this. You won't believe what happened. I tell them the whole story. The old man, the old prophet, went after the man of God. This old man is the prophet of Samaria. He went after the man of God and found him sitting under a tree. And he said, come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot return with you. The word of the Lord said, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. It says the same thing he says to him that he said to the king. He said, I too am a prophet. This man of Samaria, this old prophet, this old man of Samaria says, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, Bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. And the Bible says he was lying to him. The man of God went with him and ate bread and drank water. Bad move, Bad move all right. The word of God is sure and trustworthy. And the word of the Lord came to the prophet, thus says the Lord, because you disobeyed the word of the Lord and not kept the commandment of the Lord your God 
your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Mercy of the Lord. Warning him to repent of what he just did and prophesying what is going to be the result. Maybe I don't need the Lord's hand so powerfully coming down and withering people's hands because then the judgment of the Lord comes to every upon those with high responsibilities. There's high expectations as well. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it the lion also stood by the corpse. Men saw the corpse thrown on the road and the lion standing by it, and they told it in the city. The lion had not eaten the corpse nor torn the donkey. Very interesting sight. <laughs> you see a dead man, you see a donkey, you see a lion. The lion's just sitting there, not eating the man, not eating the donkey. They're just sitting there. People are walking by, look at that. They go back to the city, you won't believe what's out there. <laughs> the false prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, the lion doesn't bother him, and brought it back. He laid the corpse on his tomb and mourned over him. He said to his sons, when I am dead, Bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. For the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar of Bethel will surely come to pass. Repentance, faith and belief in God and belief in the word of the Lord. He says, bury me with this man. God's word's going to come to pass. The young boy is going to come named Josiah. He's going to burn, sacrifice the priests on this altar. He's going to burn men's bones on this altar. He's going to come from the house of David. I believe. Bury me with this man when I die. So back now to 2 Kings, back to Josiah's day, 300 years into the future. Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the king of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, and he did to them according to all the deeds that he had done in Bethel. So he continues his cleansing throughout northern Israel. He executed all the Kohanim of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them, and he returned to Jerusalem, fulfilling every detail of the prophecy. There was two parts to that prophecy, right? Well, several parts, right? There would be a boy, his name would be Josiah, he'd be of the line of David, that he would sacrifice the priests on that altar, and that he'd burn the dead bones. Well, he burned the bones in the other verse, digging them up, and now he's sacrificing the priests and fulfilling the prophecy to the T, exactly as the man of God from Judea, prophesied regarding him. Now, I look back, a lot of these pictures and texts and stuff I got from, we preached this sermon because we've been doing this series on the kings of Judea and Israel. And so I looked to find these texts and, and where it was, and it was four years ago. Four years ago. It took, it's taken us four years to go to first, from 1 Kings chapter 12 to 2 Kings chapter 23 with the prophets, Isaiah and, and other prophets, along the way. That doesn't even count Solomon and David and the Proverbs and Psalms. <laughs> I didn't look at far back, just went to this one. The word of God is sure and steadfast and sure. It's trustworthy. And it's the same today, yesterday, and forever. God calls us to believe the word of God and to stand fast by the word of God. No matter what anyone else tells us, no matter if a 
familiar spirit comes to us saying, they came back from heaven and this is how God changed his word. No matter who says, an angel came to me or whatever. The word of God is the word of God. And it doesn't change. It doesn't contradict itself. It's true and everlasting. We're going to be men and women of God. and Maybe that's why he doesn't have a name because it applies to each one of us. God calls us to be faithful to his word. To be instant in season and out of season, ready to always to give an answer for our faith, rebuking sin, standing for the right, and being obedient to it in our own lives. Regardless of what anyone else says, whether kings or so-called old men or old women or prophets or whatever they may be, following the word of the Lord and walking in its light. Because we will be held accountable. Every single one of us will be held accountable to follow the word of the Lord. And to do what God has called us to do. So when Josiah turns and sees this grave. He says, whose grave is this? Whose tomb is this? It's the man of God. 300 years that, made, that story continued on. Even though northern Israel, Bethel would cost aside king after king, different dynasties. That story stayed. As a living testimony long after he was gone. And the man of Samaria buried there with him. His sons were obedient and did to him as he asked. And this Josiah says, leave those two men's bones alone. God calls our testimony to live on after us as well. Generation to generation. I believe it's very, 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 very possible for each one of us here to live to see the coming of the Lord. But even if we don't, God wants our testimony to continue on after us. I don't know why I did that, but whatever. Let's have prayer together. And ask the Lord to work in our behalf. And if there's some area of our life that God's calling us to, maybe he's calling us to go speak to somebody Give a word of the Lord to somebody. Word of encouragement or a word of rebuke. May we be faithful to the word of the Lord. Faithful in our hearts and minds. May we be obedient to what the word of God tells us and live it out in our lives. And may the scripture be fulfilled in us. Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. Their deeds do follow them. The testimony continues on. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we are thankful that your word is sure and true and dependable. We're thankful for the instruction it gives us. We're thankful for the hope it gives us. We're thankful for the promises there for us. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit. You'd forgive us and cleanse us of times when we've been disobedient. We claim and accept the sacrifice of the Messiah in our behalf. For where we have disobeyed, for where we have doubted, for where we put our bellies before the word of God, our ease and our comfort before your word, where we've sold out. Lord, forgive us for selling out. Make us steadfast and true. Lord, forgive us and we accept the sacrifice of the Messiah for forgiveness for where we've shirked our responsibilities of obeying your word and for standing for truth. Forgive us for not giving the words of comfort or the words of correction. Cleanse our hearts and minds and bring us into harmony with you. 
Forgive us, Lord, for when we've been false prophets. Forgive us, Lord, for when we've lied. Forgive us, Lord, for where we, when we've misinterpreted. Forgive us, Lord, for when we have led people astray, whether purposefully or accidentally. Lord, cleanse us and forgive us. Lord, may your word be true regarding each one of us. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.